Okay, there'll be time afterwards to continue these conversations. Um, it's a great pleasure to uh, have Frank Woodman here to speak to us this evening, and uh, I'll introduce Frank in a moment. But before I do, I just want to say that uh, I want to talk about the uh, Twelfth Night Party and the uh, yeah, what's going on about that, just in case people snoop off before I have a chance to mention it. Um, the Twelfth Night Party was meant to be on the 4th of January. Uh, it's been to a rail strike and we've been decided that we'll defer it until the 1st of February. So after the lecture on the 1st of February. Okay? So the lecture on the 4th of January, Sarah Griffin's lecture on opportunistic mischief will still go ahead. That lecture will still go ahead, but the Twelfth Night Party has been moved to the 3rd of October. Okay? All right. So with that out of the way, I can introduce briefly the panel of lectures. Dr. Frank Woodman. Uh, Frank uh, is very well known to those who are CAA regulars. Uh, maybe the last spoken to him on April 6th when they had the panel there at the meeting yeah. of BAA. So anyway, Frank has uh, braved the tube for the first time in three years to, to uh, speak to us and speaking frankly uh, publicly with his APL and Millie Black sessions and his hanging card. Uh, tonight he's talking to us about making the Alpha Male the Australian Prime Minister. That's the theme of his new speech. And, and uh, as we uh, said a few minutes ago. Uh, so we look forward to what you've got to say, Frank. Uh, if there's anything I haven't said about you, you can... You can uh, the less said, the better. Yeah, okay. <laughs> okay, so uh, please welcome Frank Rose. Okay. <laughs> The light staff, it doesn't worry me, but oh no, we're going down. Right. Doesn't the 12th night party make it the 28th night party or something on the 4th of I'm going to talk about this church, and as Julian's just discovered, you'll see why I'm only going to refer to the whole thing as Trinity for the rest of the evening. That is a mouthful when it comes. This church, I was about when I walked in, thought I'm probably the only person who's seen this church. I need to bump straight into Richard Halsey, who tells me they've got a weekend flat or they go there every day. They're always going there, so he's seen this church. But I don't expect too many others have seen the church. What I, all I want to do really tonight is to say this is a relatively little-known building, partly because it's incredibly difficult to get to. Uh, it's on a rock stuck out in the Adriatic. And it's not just where it is, but where it is, is has become really important in the last seven weeks because some very new things have suddenly appeared uh, in print and online. But it's the date what it looks like, and who built it. And this is what, not what you would expect out of a church where it is. This is, in fact, Trimiti. These are the islands of Trimiti. And they are 20 kilometers off the southeast coast of Italy. They're off Puglia. Uh, the, I, this is taken from the, the, the smallest of the inhabited islands, San Nicola, where the church is. We're looking across to the larger island, San Domino, San Domino which they have tried to green up in the last century, uh, and not very successfully. They are completely wild, barren rocks, but two of them have access to water, courtesy of at least the Romans, if not the main island, the Greeks. The islands have featured in, we have a problem with this church, and that is lack of facts. Now that's something that's never stood in my way, you might think. Lack of facts, because we don't have a lot of history, but we have a lot of our great friend, legend. But we have to bear in mind that people create legends, and some of those legends are created by people who have a vested interest in what they're saying. It's very definitely true here. We can't say the same with ancient Greeks, who had the setting of Diomedes and Aphrodite and all their gallimurfering or whatever they were doing on these islands. In fact, San Domino, that's a very strong Greek inheritance. And there has been, three, four years ago, just before COVID, a big excavation of that island by the University of Bologna. And they found a lot of pre-Greek and Greek stuff there. So there's quite a long uh, period of habitation. The main history of the island was dominated by what the Romans did to it. They turned them into penal colonies. And so there were places to go and dump people you didn't want, including an emperor's wife, knowing that they could never escape. But that means, of course, they had to have islands with access to water. The other problem for the island, for, for us too, is the weather. The weather is atrocious, and you get wild storms, this was taken on, uh, we waited days and days to get a day, a, 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 a day this calm in order to get a boat to take us there. Because that's the problem. You had a boat to take you there, but get, getting a boat to come and get, take you back again is not a 
altogether reliable. It's not their fault. The weather just turns at a sixpence. So this is the lagoon, if you like, which after the Roman period became nothing more really than a safe haven. That's a very important phrase from Byron. Fishermen from the mainland, which is, we'll show you the mainland where it is, but off to the left, can shelter in the place and still do, knowing that they can also take on water. That's quite important. If you want to extend your fishing across the Adriatic to the Dalmatian coast, having a safe haven quite a long way off the coast of Italy where you can get hold of water. That's important to the story. Now, courtesy of Wikipedia, but nevertheless, this is where we want to be. This is the period we want to look at, the early 11th century. And we want to see where the Trimiti Islands are. Uh, is this showing on the screen? It's showing on mine. Yes. The O of Benevento is the spur on the boot of Italy. Uh, and that is the Gargano Peninsula. And the Y of Principality is where the islands roughly lie. Notice across the water, which wasn't of any interest to me three months ago and suddenly is of great interest to me, we have what was they, they're calling Croatia, what was then the Principality of Zara, uh, and Spalato split. And just as we'll see in a minute, just off the screen on the right, you've got Ragusa, or modern-day Dubrovnik. So courtesy of Google Earth, there is the positioning of these islands. And notice in particular the cathedral city of Vieste. And Vieste is, is the launching off pad to get you to go to see these islands. So you see, they are rather stranded out in a very difficult bit of water. Uh, and across the water there is ancient, uh, old medieval Ragusa, now Dubrovnik. And here you've got Bari, just to put you in the map. Bari there and Naples over there. Now, the Gargano Peninsula, this is the mainland, just opposite the island, is a very remote place. It's very difficult to get at. Uh, uh, and it has been, until quite recently, quite a dodgy place to go to, uh, as da quite dangerous, up until really last Monday, I think. And, but if people don't go there willingly. <laughs> it's not somewhere you want to go and have to spend for your holiday. And Vieste itself is a bit of a rough place. But the mainland has plenty of stone and plenty of tree, wood. But the problem is, getting wood or stone to the islands to build, given the water conditions, the weather conditions, is very difficult. And it looks as though when you see the abbey in a minute, they've dug the abbey up to get the stone. So you've got a very limited supply of stone. Probably had a limited supply of skilled labor too. Though the wood could probably float itself across, but we have no wood surviving. Now, when I showed this to someone the other day, they said it was Sing Sing or Alcatraz or something. Well, yes, it is. This is the sad state of this building. The part we're interested in is merely that bit. That is the church. The rest of the building that you see was a medieval fortified monastery. The Bourbons turned it into a terrible prison camp, which went on through the Italian state. Libyan prisoners of war were imprisoned there, the great monument to them. And then Mussolini continued that right up until the Allies arrived. So it's been a penal colony in much of its recent history. Very sad history it is too. But that between the two turrets there is the, the church we're going to talk about. This was an unusually calm five minutes. We were nearly thrown out of the boat just as we were around the corner by the current coming around the island to get to it. This is the ledger. Now, we have to point out this is leg end, all right? This is no means of proving any of this. But it comes from Monte Cassino. Now, Monte Cassino, you can read it. They've established monastic presence. They say fishermen are so often taking shelter there, they ought to have some community of monks there on the islands to look after them. And one of them apparently became a hermit. Uh, and to attract a cult following if you're a hermit is a bit counterproductive, I would have thought. But anyway, we don't know when he died. We have no dates for any of this. He was buried, and eventually, the abbey was built on his tomb. Now, a local law, this is an important part of the story. We don't know if any of this is true, but it doesn't matter because it's part of what his cult was about. A local lord from the mainland just, just decided it was a good idea to go and dig him up, bring him back, and have a cult in their own on the mainland. And every time they sent a boat to try and dig him up, the grumpy saint threw up storms and winds and everything, drove them all away. Now, this either is the origin of or fed into the legend that the saint Nicola could control the weather. And that, if you're fishing communities, is an extremely important part of the, your belief system. So we, nobody ever tells us about a pilgrimage to this site. It's just assumed that there is. But we'll come back to the end of this because somebody tells us there is a pilgrimage of another cult to this abbey. 
And that is something I didn't know six weeks ago, so it's hot. This is how you arrive. Uh, this is the Gly uh, Harbour put in in the Middle Ages. It was fortified from uh, the 13th century. The present harbour is mostly Mussolini. It's the only landfall on the island. And the rest of it, you can see that the island is naturally fortified. It saw off a, a, an attempt by the Turks in the 16th century to land, and they failed to do so. So most of the island looks like this. It's a very, uh, well, unpromising looking thing. The way up is a series, a classic series of zigzags with a fortress gate at every turn, or from restored in the 1960s, a lot of this. And eventually, in the 1960s, you get the Disney-esque approach put in for the expected hordes of tourists who, of course, have never turned up for reasons that are fairly obvious. But that gatehouse owes more to Walt Disney, I think, than anything else. But behind it, you'll see the main entrance to the abbey as it was fortified in the 13th century. In fact, I, ironically, the upper part of that wall there is older than the lower part because they cut the rock away to get, make a deeper ditch in later fortifications. So you've got a, an older wall sitting on top of the original rock wall. Now, this gate is in a very peculiar position in the monastic layout, and there's a reason for that. But you see that beak-looking tower, lots of things coming from the 13th and 14th century there, all a bit restored in the 60s, uh, and some Roman or possibly even Greek stone put into some of the, the gatehouse, for example, the door. The reason that the gate is there is because the moment you walk in, you fall over that. And this is the only water on the entire island. And it was very important to the fishermen, of course, they wanted the water, but the abbey needed the water, and then the fortress had to have the water protected within the fortress. Uh, circumference. So that is a Roman well, undoubtedly with a Renaissance top on it. If you then go back to your right and outside the gate again, there you see the current state of the collapsing West Front. Now the West Front has a date on it and it also has a Napoleonic date on the stair where they extended the platform in front of it. It's a very steeply sloping site, this church, and that's matters, that's important to the story. That wall, when you get, you can't get up to it on the outside, you can see Things were dropping off as we stood there. And it's in a very neglected, dangerous condition, this building. And no matter what's said to the Italian government, no one's prepared to do anything about it. That wall is essentially 11th century, but it's completely faced up with the data that you've got on it there. Uh, I think we have to assume the church had a west door. But when the church was fortified, this was outside the fortifications. So presumably the door was then locked up only to be unblocked again in the 15th century, but then destroying any evidence there might have been for a previous door. All we can say, and we couldn't get up to measure it ever because of the scaffolding, the state of it, there is a window somewhere about there. Uh, and I probably made that arrow too big. It's quite a small, we'll see it in a minute. But that rather shows us there is a period window of the original church contained in that wall. So that wall is the original west wall. That's the other end of the, of the site. So the chance of seeing any of the exterior of this church is about almost nil. We'll see a tiny bit that we can see. That is 13th century, 15th century, and Mussolini. And that's what most of the exterior of this complex looks like. The interior is derelict to the point where even I wouldn't go into some of it. It was so dangerous. And that meant that you couldn't inspect the east wall of the church from the back because it's just not safe. I, I decided not to go in on both occasions. That is the south wall. Even that is 13th century extension to the building put up because the islands are called Tremiti for a reason. They tremor. They have earthquakes. It's a seismic zone. It's not volcanic, but it's seismic. And in the 13th century, a major overhaul was done, apparently after an earthquake, to damage the building. And this section here is entirely 13th century, so we can't see the south side at all. We can see the north side. <coughs> now the north side partly collapsed in the 1960s. And they've left reveal things that were then exposed by, uh, I think it was an earthquake then. The cloister itself is 1513. But behind it, you can see above, you can see uh, a piece of, uh, of uh, early, late 13th, early 14th century. We don't know. It's not clear. There's not much of it left. But they faced up the wall on both sides, apparently, the old walls, encased them with new walls, raised them, and put rib bolts in. So the old wall is much lower, and you can see it now peeking out where it's collapsed. Now, these are all in a row, but clearly they don't relate to the, to the church in the same way. The one on the left is clearly an exterior window into the church. You can see it's extremely crude as a piece of construction. 
The rough stone rubble below is almost certainly concealed originally by a cloister roof. They wouldn't have seen that. So the building only became exposed where you've got the rather approximate masonry. Some of it could be Roman, although a lot of it just looks like stuff dug out of the island itself. Just to the, to the as it shows on the picture, to the right, there's a window into the church from a building that clearly back, butted onto it at that point. But then almost immediately, you can see the base of another tiny window uh, exposed on the extreme right of this, blocked up now. Uh, and it's not clear how those windows are arranged, but they are the only external features of the church from the 11th century that we can see. So it's not very promising. The plan. Now, in 2007, uh, one of the scientific institutes uh, of Italy um, went and did a laser, laser measurement of this church. So that was important. It's, this is the best plan we've got available. They did it as part of a campaign to try and get the Italian government to take this building on board and do something about it. Did they? No. Now, you can see that the plan is tripartite. You've got, very clearly, you've got, I don't know how to do this, you've got a, a presbytery, East End, don't forget this is monastic, with a shrine. So we have to assume that this area here, before it had rib vaults put onto it, had both the monastic altar and the shrine of the saint. He was so grumpy, it seems unlikely they moved him. I think he, once you've dug a, a rock-cut tomb for somebody on a rocky island, and he then and man manages to kill everybody who comes near him, you don't dig him up and put him somewhere else. So I think we must assume, but we don't know this, of course, that the shrine was there. The high altar was there for the, for the monastic complex. The monastic nave is, to all intents and purposes, square. And you've got north and south aisle, and then you've got this very extensive west block. Reserve judgment or what word we use for it there. Now, I have to touch on one thing during this about a publication, a very important publication in the, about 40 years ago uh, about this church, which goes off at something of a tangent about that nave. And I think it's not necessary, but I just will mention it because it's in print and, it'll, and I'll show you where to find it. Uh, those, uh, the apses at the eastern end are not unusual, of course. We can't guarantee that they all look completely new today. Uh, it gives some um, credence then to this plan put out by the superintendent of the region in 1961. And there are things in this plan that I can't guarantee now. The basic plan is correct according to the laser plan, so that's all right. But it's these two columns here. that They're not there. Uh, there's a mosaic, a very damaged mosaic there now. But I can't guarantee mapping those two piers into a spot they could have gone through to look without disturbing the mosaic. And anyway, it's built on absolutely solid rock. So no attempt nowadays to LIDAR or laser scan or whatever would work because it's solid rock. So we can't guarantee those piers were there. I know why they think they're there, because of what happens to the piers north and south of those there and there. And those two were there, although they're not there now. We can prove from the standing structure that you needed two intervening piers to, to cross the division between the nave and the presbytery. So they're all right. If you accept that series of lost piers, it's quite interesting the whole church breaks down into, into threes. Everything is divided into three, so in the main spaces. So you've got, you've got uh, three arches, three arches, three arches, three arches, three arches. It's all done in threes. And it would be nice if that were true, but we can't guarantee that it is. Notice in 1961, there was no evidence of the apse there that is, was present in the building in, 19, in 2017. So that's the extent of work that was presumably done during this. I can't call it a restoration of this church in the 60s. I think they went at it with a JCB. It's one of the most violent looking things you've ever seen to get a church out because it was a Baroque church until 1961 or even later, maybe early 18th century, you can, you can see the remains of it. And there are no photographs of it that I can find of what it looked like before they ripped it out. But they really went at it in a, in a way that I don't think uh, would happen today. If you look at the roof of the church, it, it, it emphasizes the, the curious spacing. Obviously, the east end has to have space for the monastic altar and the shrine. But it's that western end that's given so much priority, almost a third of the space of the building is given over in a monastic church to an area that has this what, what function leaving you with the square nave that we'll come to. I won't hold you on any longer. Here we are, inside. Now, this is the church as rearranged uh, in, after the Vatican Council. 
Now, there's a lot going on here that we can try and unpick and ignore. All the autism things, of course, are all shifted around uh, from various places. The interesting thing in the north side of the chancel, uh, we can ignore the, uh, the, the 1700 window here. This is very interesting, but it turns out that that window was smashed for so long that water just poured down the wall for a long time over the plaster. It doesn't seem to have any significance architecturally, but that is interesting because on either side, they're not medieval. I don't know when they are, but they're not medieval. But to the excavators or restorers of 1961, that pier went with an arch coming across, and coming across. That was the level of the springing. That's what they, so that put it in their head that those piers had to be there. I think, if, I can't guarantee they found them. The floor does not show any sign of it today. Also, the work is buried. This is the 11th century work. We'll come up with a date in a minute. But the corners have been strengthened when the river falls went in. That seems to be work started in the 13th century and carried on perhaps into the 14th century as well. And we don't know how many times this church has fallen over in earthquakes. So there is the space of the, of the chancel. And you can see there's not a lot of it. If you've got a conventional shrine running east-west over the tomb, where the altar now is, and then the monastic altar, then that's it. You've got a rather cramped space. It doesn't suggest to me that the church is, can be arranged to allow Beckett-style numbers of pilgrims to come in. I think the odd boatload of fishermen come in and probably present some fish and pray and all the rest of it and go. I don't get the impression the church can deal with huge numbers of people, but that's something that has been challenged uh, in the last couple of months. That is the length of the church. It's very, very small. Um, I'm standing now at the present west door, looking along to the east end. You, you can't but notice the floor. Now, the floor has had so much attention in print, whereas the church hasn't, because the floor has always been visible. So people have always concentrated on that floor, not knowing what con was contained within the structure around it. And since 1961, uh, there's been very little publication about this church. That is one of the photographs taken during the, well, excavation. I don't know what a word is appropriate for the treatment of this building, but you can see it was 1700-ish cased up. And they, what they've done is rip it away. And the ripping away has done a lot of damage. And that means that some of the features we see now are in a state that's so damaged, we can't guarantee what they might have looked like when it was built. Now. The interesting thing, of course, which gets Richard Halsey jumping up and down, is that it has a giant order. That is the north side of the nave. Right at the top, you've got the remains of the church they ripped out, including its awful ceiling, unfortunately, they left that. But that was the case up that came down, blocked all this up out of sight until the 1960s. Now, you'll see that the giant order is a proper giant order. It's not inscribed into the wall. They are great pit compound piers that rise up. The arches are real arches. The walls are inside them. It's not some decorative device put onto the wall, at least not on the north and south and west side. We can't guarantee what the east side looked like because it's been changed. But that giant order is obviously of great significance if we can come up with a date for the building. That's looking across the nave into the the wall between the chancel and the nave, and you can see the springers of those side arches have been revealed. And if you, if you map that out, you have to have two narrow arches and a, a wider arch, and therefore perhaps a higher arch in the middle. So it has a triple arrangement on all sides, as you'll see, of the nave. Even mm -hmm. arches, north and south, an arrangement of, of small, large, small, east and west. The western ones still survive. That tells us that the putting those pier bases in there and there, whether it was a guess or whatever, is correct, because something had to support those arches, so they are there. You can see, again, this has all been boxed up in later medieval uh, re-strengthening of the building, presumably after an earthquake. That is, uh, that is the south side of the, of the nave. The windows are all blocked because the later medieval aisles were raised and the roofs went over the original clerestories, and the church became uh, lit a different way. This is the South Isle. It's interesting to note that there are no bases. None of the architectural features of this building have got a base. Now, maybe that's the style, but the base is the level of the mosaic floor, which means that either the mosaic floor has been put in and has buried the bases, or it's never had any bases. And we haven't seen any bit dug up in order to find that out. They're rather touchy about the mosaic floor. For some, I can't imagine why. Uh, then these are the forms of the piers. Here you can see, for example, damage of, uh, this is where it's been ruptured in an earthquake. Uh, and you've got these rather strange 
capital forms, if you recall, and that which we'll come back to. There is the Western end. The Western end really starts to get me excited because what is that Western end? What is it for? Why do you need that in a remote monastic church stuck out on an island? Here we see the arrangement almost certainly as it was on the eastern side of the nave, a smaller arch, a wider arch, smaller arch, but smaller, larger, smaller in proportion. But through there, you can see the interesting western block. And that is divided in two alleys, north-south. The inner alley, which you're looking into here, is the, it rises to a, a full height, but it's higher than the aisles, but lower than the nave. You've got a whole series of, of, of joggled arrangements here. And there it is, looking across, south to north. Now, you see that the outer aisle, against the west wall, has a loggia, or whatever you want to call that, it has a raised platform on three arches. It doesn't span the whole building, just the central three arches. You have to ask, in the monastic church, uh, with the, presumably a very small community, because you can't feed your, you can't grow anything on the island. So you're totally dependent upon fish and getting stuff from the mainland. So you can't have ever had a large monastic community, you couldn't, and given the weather, you couldn't have guaranteed to feed them. But there's, that's an interesting feature to the building. And it has a straight stair up. And I'm sorry, I, it reminded me immediately of conch, so I put conch up. But actually looking at these things, I, I think straight stairs up to these things are quite Western built, but it's quite rare. Maybe not. You need to tell me about 55 others. But that must be an original feature because there is no other way of getting up to that loggia. When you get up there, you see it is quite high. Uh, there is the stair, and there is the space. It doesn't go anywhere. So the only reason to go up there is to go up there. So why are you up there and who are you? There is that one remaining window there, which is now blocked by the redressing of the west wall. Now, one reason to go up there is to stand, I can't get the thing down, there, there right? Because, or well, there, it has a very dramatic view. And it's clearly the view that you're after. That is the view. So quite clearly, that lodger is put there so that me or anyone else can stand and look along that monastic nave to the altar and to the shrine. But you're not within the monastic enclosure, which suggests that people who are not part of the order are coming into the church and are privileged enough to be up. I don't think the fishermen are up there with their cockles and mussels. I think this is something rather grander than that. But you do get the scale of the church, and of course, can't take your eyes off that floor. That floor is interesting. I will say, I have no great views on the floor. But this is what we know, and I say not necessarily true. In 1960, a whole series of charters were, were published, and the, the editor at the time said they're nearly all forgeries. In 1059, Desiderius, the, the abbot of Monte Cassino, complained to the Pope that the Abbey of Trimiti would not accept that it was a dependent cell of Monte Cassino. And the Pope asked the abbot of Trimiti, what's it all about, what's going on? This is what he said. Uh, the abbot said that the church had been built by a predecessor, a man, oh, I put it on there, a man called Elbrich. That's an interesting name, trying in southern Italy. They received privileges from Conrad II, and a new church was built. Conrad II, it was almost at the end of his life here, of course. These privileges are interpreted by most historians to mean land and property, and we know, we know they did in fact have land and property on the mainland given to them by the emperor of Germany. That really ups the ante about this building. And they were confirmed by uh, uh, Frederick, uh, Henry III, his successor. One suggestion is they were actually enhanced by Henry III. So we have an immediate imperial German interest when the church is being built. We know that in 1040, in 1045, the altar was dedicated, but they had to wait for a, a bishop to come from the mainland. So we have no idea how long they waited. Now that means that the church is being built, not only with the money, the patronage of Conrad II, but in his lifetime. It's in, being built in the 1030s. And of course, I think some of you probably ahead of me here about what that Im implication there is for the building. Then we have these continuous rows with Monte Cassino. We get... Uh, in 1059, that's when the court case is heard in Rome, and presumably the Pope is able to t ask uh, diplomats from the empire, is this true? I mean, they're all still around, these people, and they must have said yes, because he tells Desiderius to go away and forget about it. But then we have this seesawing. Monte Cassino keeps trying to get back in. 
They're the people <coughs> who come up with the legend. They're the people who've got a vested interest that it was them in the first place. It's always been theirs. If only one pope says, all right, let's appoint an abbey, but very soon the same pope cancels that agreement and says, no, 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 they must elect their own. And eventually in 1081, he's told, Desiderius is told to abandon all claims. But it's interesting that he then has a very brief papacy, but he never tries to change the term. He's got other things going on with that actually, brief papacy. And very curiously, in 1237, it becomes Cistercian. We don't know what the reason for that is. The house seems to die out when the Cistercians move in. <coughs> now, with that piece of <coughs> German history in mind, we hear from a, a, a source which is very irritating, and I've not been able to get back to it. But in, 19, in 2019, published only, in fact, a few months ago, the University of Bologna put out a summary of the history for their excavation of the pre-Greek and Greek period, fine. But they've got dates and things in it that I can't guarantee are correct, and they don't footnote anything. Oh, I was going to say typical archaeologists. I can't say that, but they don't. So I have to contact them and say, what, how do you know that? How do you know that? They say, and the reason I put this map up, is that the privileges, the land, the, the money that went to pay for this abbey uh, from Conrad came from uh, the Abruzzo and Molise. And that would make sense. That's at the very southern extreme of land that he might have to give away, given the borders of the empire at the time, bearing in mind that the abbey is there. In other words, food production, if they've got access to their own food on the mainland, they, can, they are independent in that sense, thanks to the emperor. Now, bearing in mind then the architecture, if we think this is going to be Conrad II paying for it in the 1030s and early 40s, I don't know what style any of these things have got. They've got the early nothing style except they don't look like what you would expect to find, and I'll show you in a minute, in Italy at the same time, just on the mainland. Most of the capitals that came out of the, of the crunch of the, what they did to it have got this strange, sort of slightly beveled look to them. When I was a young thing, these were popularly called cubic, these capitals, part way to being cushions. Now, we can't tell how much of the form that we see today was tidied up to the shape they are now in the 1960s, because not one of them came out unscathed. But of course, the automatic parallel to make for this church, and almost ridiculous in scale, is the contemporary Cathedral of Speyer being built by Conrad II. Now, we have to bear in mind that if this building in Trimiti is inspired by Speyer, their contemporary, no one from Trimiti could have gone to see Speyer standing, because it wasn't in the 1030s. It was so far up. So you had to know the inside information, what the spire would look like, if you're going to go back and copy it. There is nothing else in southern Italy, or in Italy particularly, that looks like Tremiti. You have to go into the Rhineland, and you have to point at the spire. But it does mean to say you've got some very inside information, if you know that, even though that is Holson's, what the overall impression of spire will be when it's finished. Because uh, uh, the Tremiti was almost certainly finished before Spire was halfway up the wall. Uh, they could have both gone, of course, to see the original inspiration. That's what, of course, if you've got people going backwards and forwards to Germany, they don't have to go to see an unfinished cathedral when they can go and see what may be the model with its Constantine imperial connections. But the thing that I think is very telling about uh, Tremiti is the attempt to alternate the colored blocks in the arcades. Now that happens famously in the crypt of Spire. That would be finished first, very early on, in the 1030s, our church's 1030s. Now for them, that was very difficult, and it's inconsistent in Tremiti, because there is no stone that color available on the islands. So although you can make it out of your rock, you've got a wall around you, you're going to have to bring that stone in very difficult sea conditions, the right color to make that parallel work. Nobody knew about this alternation at Trimiti, of course, until the 1960s, when it was exposed for the first time. But I think whilst Charles McLennan, who was published this 40 years ago, was very hesitant to talk about Spire, uh, looking at the, just that one feature alone, the alternation of color, you know, from the crypt at Spire to Conrad's, Conrad's building at Trimiti, somebody is in the know about what is going on there. These were the surprise. These came out there in the corners of the nave, and people say, well, they're weird. <laughs> they're not true Byzantine in the way that Byzantines would do this form of cloisonné work, although I put that up. 
to show that by Byzantine eyes will do anything with brick. You know, there, can't, there isn't a standard form. You just use brick as you want. <coughs> but this one hint of something Byzantine, if that's what it is, it's very ack-handed, it's misunderstood. It looks as if somebody's seen something and said, oh, wouldn't it be nice? You do get truly Byzantine architecture right down on the heel of Italy, which is a very long way down, but nothing as early as the church here, certainly not the 1030s. But they are a puzzle, those, and they were originally in all the four corners of the uh, nave. What the roof looked like, we have no idea. Hopefully nothing like the present roof this church has got. Why they ripped the lower parts of that rubbish away and left the upper parts of the rubbish still standing. Maybe because they didn't have a, another roof to put on. The fact that it's been re-roofed probably several times is, is almost certainly due to earthquake damage. The roof would be the first thing to go. Or fire, of course. It's very hot on those islands. If Speyer had a flat roof like that, and we're thinking of Speyer, well, then probably Trinity had a flat roof like that too. I have to put this in because this is a very important article. There's his name, and I'll show you where it's from. It's published about nearly 40 years ago now. And, uh, he veers off. He was, was able to see this church being ripped to bits. So that's the important thing. So that's why it's an important article. But he veers off and says, oh, it, it's, he brings up the Cinque Torre church uh, on the other side of Italy uh, in the foothills of Monte Cassino. Now, inconveniently for us, the Allies completely destroyed this church uh, in the advance uh, on Monte Cassino. So we only have some photographs, but some quite good 19th century drawings of it. He says, ah, oh, it has a square nave. Tremiti has a square nave, and this has a square nave. They're all in threes, right? It's the only one he can find. Well, yes. There are problems with this, of course. The first thing is look at the date of this building. It's pre-Charlemagne. It's, it's a very late, three people have published recently about this building in no relationship with Tremiti at all and said that it's one of the last hangovers of late antiquity, centralized planning, you know, a square within a square. And it was, in fact, five towers. So you had, uh, you had a high tower over the main space, and then you had towers over the corners, the Cinque Torre. It's absolutely nothing like Tremiti, and when you, these are afraid it was destroyed. But you see, it's all full of late antique work. It's very open and airy and light. It's everything you expect to find in a late antique church. It's just it happens to be of the, of the 780s and not the, the 480s. I think there's another reason why the nave at Tremiti is square. These are the very fine drawings of what we've got left of this church, but I'm not going to dwell on that because I think it's a red herring. That's, I, I think it belongs in this, it's one of those for three, 300 years later. It has exactly the same ideas of some of these late antique early Christian churches of central planning, squares within squares. Now, I just want to show before, oh, yeah, all right, I'll come back to that. Well, no, I won't. I will, <laughs> I'll do it now. The reason that the square, the nave is square at Tremiti is the site. The, you didn't dare touch the, the, the saint, so there's a fixed point. You had to dig a flat platform to make the site in any way level to build a church on it. So the fixed point is the saint, and the other fixed point is the fact that it drops off the edge of the world if you don't pull up the western end of the building. So you've got a very awkward site to build on. You've got to have an, a shrine space and an altar space, a monastic space, but it's that west block that is so big that makes, squeezes the nave. You don't need a big nave if you've got a very small community. And it's that western block always that is interesting because it has priority in that sense over the spatial arrangements before the whole site drops away. So if you end up with a square nave, so you do, and I don't think it matters. I was going to talk at length about this, but I'm not now, you'll be pleased to hear, because of what's come up in the last few weeks. But this is the cathedral on the mainland directly opposite, and it's 11th century. So it will give us some idea of what's going on in the 11th century. I'm going to show a few bits of it. It has, again, you can only see one tiny piece of one wall. It's typical Italian in that sense. It has very fine masonry. It has reused late antique work. It has everything you would expect to find in southern Italy. Uh, nothing is thrown away. And the quality, even of the basic masonry, is extremely good. Clearly, on the islands, they did not have access to stone that would cut that well, or the people who could do it in the first place. They're, these, this is almost wonderful window. Couldn't resist that. This church was also ripped out with a JCB not long after Tremiti to see what was there, just in case. You can see they stopped at the level of the, uh, of the capitals. I was worried when I saw this. It's, 
undated, it's 11th century. Some of the capitals to me look as if they're very late in the 11th century, except two things. We're dealing with the, the, the orbit of Naples, and Naples kept all the Byzantine technology. They had chisels, they had drills, they could do what they liked with stone. They had bronze casting, they had fantastic. They could do everything that the Greeks and Romans could do, more or less, that the rest of Europe couldn't do. But nevertheless, when I saw that this church with city fell to the Normans in 1054, I thought, ah, that's a bit of more Norman. But the church, the shape, the planning, the arrangement of this building, it's Cathedral of Trimiti, this is Vieste. This is what we would expect to find in uh, Eastern Puglia before the great church building campaigns after St. Nicholas of Bari comes along and gives you all those wonderful Romanist churches in the 1070s and 80s. <coughs> it exposed also reused Roman material in Vieste, much like was reused in Bari, but what date that capital is of in 1927, I have no idea. But nevertheless, the reuse of Roman material is what you would expect to find. We don't find it at all in Trimiti. It rejects it completely or has no access to it. Back in Trimiti, the only thing that happens to it is, after, I imagine, an earthquake, because they then beef up a lot of the piers that support the building. And these, for example, are done in order to put in rib vaults. If you've got a building that regularly falls on your head because of earthquakes, would you put up rib vaults? Well, they do. You've got here, this. I don't know what style these capitals are. They look like marigold margarine motifs. I don't know. They're weird, but all right, that's what they've done. These are part of the 11th century building, and this, of course, is the rib vaulting. Uh, and it's been painted, obviously. But these are, I'm showing you this because of one thing, because that is one of the weirdest doors I've ever seen. I can only assume that in 1961, they emptied up this section. This is a bit of a sort of Roman engineering. It's, it's, it's a triangle to keep the weight off the door. Uh, and I imagine it was filled in with something. You didn't see it in that way. But the arch itself, this is the north door into the cloister. The arch is interesting and because of these. There's one in Trimiti in this 13th century work. And there is Castle Now, in 1199, uh, Frederick II inherited southern Italy and Sicily and moved in next door to Vieste. Castle Monte is a short drive from Vieste and a short boat ride across to Trimiti. I suspect that the monks of Trimiti decided it was a good idea to reignite their imperial patronage when their neighbor was now the emperor. And things happened in that church. And I think that there's something about the profile of that work that looks like the doors commonly found in that castle being built in the first few years of the 13th century. <clears throat> that brings us to the floor. The floor, I know nothing about this floor, other than I don't believe anything I've read about this floor. Having seen it on a number of occasions, I thought, no. It's a spectacular floor, but it seems to have several sections, several periods of it. Several people have published recently about how there is an Adriatic school of floor mosaic, when there are only three, one in Venice, one in Pomposa, and one in Trimiti. They're all completely different and of totally different dates. How that becomes a school of mosaic flooring, I have no idea. But you've got some fairly, well, reasonable things. You've got monsters, plants. Uh, <coughs> this could be a, a, an attempt to do a late antique floor in the 11th century. Although, as I point out, the floor buries all the Romanesque work. You see 13th century bases sitting on the floor, but no 11th century bases exist. You've got some fairly jokey things like this, uh, but you've also got some very, oh, this is the floors they relate them to in print. Now the floor in Pomposa looks like the most superbly relayed jumble of a Roman flooring. It's got nothing to do with a medieval mosaic and it has got no life form, animal forms, anything in it at all. It's a purely geometrical reused Roman floor. That is the earliest apparently bit of floor in Venice, which is the other member of this mosaic floor group. But of course, the dates are all wrong. This can't be until the late 11th century because of the building dates of, and anyway, it looks absolutely nothing like Trimiti. That is the central panel of Trimiti. <coughs> I'm, I, I stare at that and think, that's really, a, could be a very poor quality reused piece of late antique, or a rather good 11th century go at being late antique. But it's the jumble of styles and, and uh, uh, quality in this floor that makes me think that it has several periods in it. The most interesting thing is that this is not of the greatest quality, not of the quality of the central part of the mosaic. It's an imperial eagle. It is where it is that matters. It's not in the nave. It is there right underneath the loggia. 
for anybody, a VIP, would be to look down and see straight at that imperial eagle. And I suspect much of the church was revamped in the 13th century. I suspect Frederick II is hopefully paying for it or may end up paying for it, they hope. And so other things are put into the floor that will in fact uh, encourage the emperor to give them some money. Uh, we don't know that he ever went there. Now, I have to introduce this because in the last five minutes, literally six weeks ago, uh, I found three articles uh, which were very interesting. Please don't try and read this because it is hilariously funny as it goes on, unintentionally. It's been put through some translation. But uh, six weeks ago, I was reading through the French school in Rome journal of 2019, which has only just come out, my bedtime reading. Um, there was a, a very dense Italian article uh, about Promethea. And I thought, oh, that's interesting. It's nothing to do with the architecture here. It's about what it owned, who it, where it, how it was positioned in the, in the medieval world. And it took you to this place called Beshevo. And Beshevo is a very similar situation to, in Croatia to Tremiti to Italy. It's an island, off an island, off the mainland of Croatia today. It was the uh, principality of Zanar at the time. And you can see here in the rather nice, uh, Opatia is, is the uh, Croatian for monastery. What it says is, there's this constant flow of people going from the Croatian coast today to Tremiti, monks who go and stay in Tremiti and learn uh, and are trained in Tremiti and then go back, forwards. But they also say many men go on pilgrimage, but not to the grumpy saint. They're going to the icon of Mary, the Holy Mother of God. Now, we know nothing about Mary and the Holy Mother of God from any Italian source. It has this icon of, which has cult following on the coast. This monastery founded in Beshevo is then given to Tremiti and all the possessions that it has. So in 1050, they get a, a huge upgrade in their income, if you like, a lot of territory and money coming from the other side of the Adriatic <coughs> and pilgrims. They conveniently don't mention that to the Pope nine years later. All they tell the Pope is that they're imperial. All their money comes from the emperor. They're clearly stressing that side. They don't mention the fact that they've got property, monasteries on the other side of the Adriatic and pilgrims coming. But even Desiderius, who has stayed on the island as a monk in 1055, <coughs> he doesn't raise that either. He must have known about that. He could, they couldn't have hidden these monks just because somebody else turned up. The interesting thing is this, this icon, this is what you see on the island today, and there's nothing of this monastery left anymore. One thing that's really, really sad, here we have the venerable image of the Mother of God up here. I quite like this last sentence at the bottom here, where when they're, they get their independence and they're allowed to elect their own abbot, or as they say, they are with its own abyss in the forehead. Those of us who lecture without notes know all about an abyss in the forehead. Now, the important thing here is, though, this puts this monastery not on the, out on a limb, in the, you know, pointing at Albania, but in fact, it has huge connections on the other side, bringing in money and pilgrims. The only time pilgrims are ever mentioned with Trimedi, even the fishermen are never called pilgrims, is these people coming from the Zadarian Principate. Now, <clears throat> that rather changes the view of things because of this. Not these two things in particular, but another article that came out, a, a chapter that came out uh, in the last few months in a book. I've got, I'll show you the references coming up later. There's a book that's come out, it's called Byzantium, Venice, and the Adriatic before the sack of Constantinople or something. And it's got a whole chapter on the dealings of the Abbey of Trimiti financially with patrons in mainland Italy. And it has two cases it concentrates on, both of a bishop called Geraldus in the middle of the 11th century, and he is negotiating with Tremiti because they have access to Constantinopolitan icons and a cloth, which is called Scaramanga, which we can't really track down. I spent much of this morning sitting in hospital trying to do that, find that. But in fact, we don't know. All we know is that this fabric was hugely expensive. It was made of silk, and the only place that could make silk outside China was the imperial court in Constantinople. They smuggled silkworms or the rest of it in quite early on, and they reserved that fabric for court vestments and clothing. <clears throat> this bishop is able to get through Tremiti to get, to get, they can get Constantinopolitan icons, and they can get this fabric. 
on two occasions. It's very expensive. On one occasion, he pays 20 gold pieces for the icon and 30 gold pieces for a length of this silk cloth. It isn't just something you buy in the market in Aleppo that's come from China. This is something very specific that has this sort of Byzantine holy connotation. I put up Russia here because that icon there, of course, is, was made in 1050 to 52, exactly the period that we're talking about this bishop is dealing with. That's the quality. And I point out the size. It's almost as big as it appears on the screen. We're not talking about little tiny things. And as the author of that chapter says, if Trameti already had a holy icon that had pilgrimage, and they could, not, they could trade not one but two in rapid succession, they had very easy access to them. In other words, they had easy access to items coming out of the Byzantine court circle. I put the other one up because <coughs> there's also a possibility that, that during the, the uh, period of iconoclasm, a lot of things were stashed away and hidden, and they came out and could be resold and traded uh, when life returned to normal, like the one in Rome, which has an unknown date, but it's clearly pre-iconoclastic uh, period. But this is a trade we know, we knew until <laughs> this autumn, we knew nothing about. And that made, brought me back to a question that I first asked myself when I first went to the islands. Why were the German emperors interested, so interested in those islands? If you ask Google how to get from the Rhineland to Constantinople, <laughs> up that issue, it's a rather strange stops en route. Well, the first route is obviously quite impossible up until 1989. Nobody could have done that route. But the other one that you still would do today is to drive all the way down through Italy to Bari, just south of, 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 of Tramiti, and cross to Patras. It's one of the shortest crossings, which takes you straight into the Byzantine Empire over Greece to, to Constantinople. And if you don't happen to own Bari, which of course the German emperors didn't, and southern Italy uh, is a troublesome place, and even north Italy had a long history of being troublesome to the emperors, when you had the Ottonians married into the Byzantine family, right? Conrad was the first who was not. But there must have been strong links of communication set up, getting yourself from Germany to Constantinople, which even if it stopped being family connection and traveling, would carry on being diplomatic. And the Ottonians almost always used bishops as diplomats. We have letters that go back. We know that these people are, are bishops. It would be very convenient if you could get onto a boat as soon as you cross the Alps, up the top of the Adriatic here, sail past all the trouble, all the trouble, all the trouble, and go to your island, that you, you were the patron of with a monastery, stay there and then get water, <laughs> and then make the short crossing to Patras, uh, which is what is indicated on that blue line today of modern transport. And I rejected that thought when I first went there. I thought, how silly is that? Because we're stuck out on a rock in the middle of nowhere. But it now seems to me that all those icons and all that court fabric, silk fabric from Constantinople, is almost certainly coming through in diplomatic bags. And it was probably a very, very lucrative trade for that monastery, which they kept quiet about. But it's no wonder that Monte Cassino made so many attempts to get their hands on that abbey. Thank you. Thank you very much, Frank. It's showing you how much you can do with a little bit of evidence. <laughs> And, you know, a lot of... Lot of what are you saying? Nice <laughs> holiday photographs. No, it's absolutely wonderful the way you brought this thing to life. And, you know, you managed to get the desk completely possible. You even get Novgorod. Yeah, even got Novgorod in there. Yeah. Have we got questions in the audience? I'm going to flash up the images of the important, three important articles, all right, if you want to know what they are. That's the important early one. You haven't come to a conclusion about that. I think it's, it's I think you it's, haven't come to a conclusion. I think it's an imperial court space. You think it's an imperial, a, a would be imperial court. If any, space. any of them ever yeah. turned up. Yeah. But the bishops that came, as if they were diplomats, and a bishop could be consecrated as a bishop, um, they're, they're not necessarily part of the monastic community anyway. No. So they would have to have some prestigious area to put them to attend mass. Where did the fishermen worship on this island? In that abbey. Yeah. But they weren't resident. No, of course not. No. no. But they might have used that yes. Western space. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm, I'm moving these on because that is the, that is the important book of recent, of recent months. Here we go. We've got some questions. 
may I ask something about, about the maritime routes? About um, the maritime routes. I mean, you, you, you suggested quite convincingly this idea of uh, Germany to Constantinople through the Adriatic and that place uh, on, on the Tremiti Islands playing a role. I was wondering, I mean, you did explain that there is no, apart from that uh, Dalmatian pilgrimage evidence, there is no other clear evidence of pilgrims getting there, right? The At, only uh, other Nicola. evidence, answer that question. The only other evidence that there was is the legend that the mainland Julian Lord tried to get the body in order to yeah. move the pilgrimage to the mainland. And that's vir virtually the only reference we have in, in Western literature, right, as opposed to Croatia, <laughs> uh, about that there is pilgrimage. Yeah, I, I'm just wondering whether, whether there could be an additional, I mean, uh, Monte Gargano is very close uh, on the Gargano Peninsula, yeah. the Shrine of St. Michael, which was a major pilgrimage shrine and was popular in exactly the same period. So imagining someone sailing from Venice or the top of the Adriatic to go well, out into the Mediterranean or to the Holy Land on pilgrimage, they would often stop at Monte Gargano. They would, I think, usually they would go along the, the eastern coast, the Dalmatian coast, because of all the islands and easy places to get supplies. But then if they want to get to Monte Gargano, they would cross to the other side, and they would go past the Tremiti Islands. So could they not have stopped there on the way if it was already an established sort of... In that rather gibberish, unfortunate account from the Croatian site, we don't, it doesn't specify who the men going on pilgrimage mm. are or where they're coming from. And they could equally come from Venice or Ragusa or anywhere along that coast, or having come down to any other part of Europe. But one thing about the Trinity Islands is they are extremely difficult to get to, and you really have to want to get there. That's the main thing. And, but if there is this constant stream going from Dalmatia to the islands, and there's the fishermen, therefore presumably others, going from the main of Italy to the islands, then it, it can just keep going on. You don't have to sort of move on. It can be an island hopping every time. Yeah. The interesting thing is that Conrad II, early in his um, uh, career, had to go to that area of Italy. Uh, where there was trouble. He had to go and sort things out uh, south of his own border, so places like uh, uh, near the Naples area. And it's possible that he then, in the 1020s when this happened, he may have seen the, these islands. We don't know how he... Did he go over land all the way through to the Papal States? I mean, well, he could have done. They, they hadn't fallen out by then. But travelling by sea was probably safer because of its shore. Uh, but uh, certainly that island group is a safe haven. Even today, it's referred to as a safe haven. What I hadn't realized until October, November, was that it wasn't stuck out there. It was a huge hub of trading routes and apparently pilgrim routes. But that Bishevo account is the only reference to pilgrims at all. And it's not to the saints. It's to some holy icon. Thanks. Yeah, Jan and David, a, a quick... Yeah, on the surface of it, an economical or, you know, an economical or territorial reason for this thing being here just seems to make well, two emperors in a row wanted it. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. I was just wondering um, whether you considered uh, uh, Trani at all. Um, it's this is not my area of expertise at all, but it just kind of I just I was thinking of the mosaic floor, and well, it reminded Trani, me. Trani of is one of the post St Nicholas of Bari churches. So you you're going once St Nicholas of Bari kicks off. It's interesting that. Having failed to get San Nicola from Tremiti, they then get San Nicholas from, from Myra. But the, uh, the churches in uh, that follow on San Nicholas. For the floor, Frank, not for the building. Well, do you think the floor in Trani is earlier than the building? No, but the floor you think is later than the building, yes? Oh, well, I, I've, I don't know. I, as I say, I have no strong views at all about that floor. All I think is it's got several periods. And all I know is that the earliest parts of the floor appear to bury any architectural basis, if there are any. I mean, I don't know very much about, you know, what the research that has been done on Trani, but I, I was there in June. And in the from the very... Trani, Trani. Oh, uh, Trani, yeah. yeah. Um, from the little that I read, I was under the impression that the floor there is dated also to the 11th century. And it also has... No? Is it later? Later? Oh, sorry. Tw yeah. Uh, but it also has these kind of monsters and things. But it, I was also thinking that they also have this little Byzantine church dedicated to St. Peter, I think. 
which is also a kind of a square within a square with three apses. So I, I, it just popped into my head. It wasn't. John is itching to put in. Yes. John. Well, he's loud enough. Go on. Um, I, I, I was wondering, actually, about, about the floor, oh, the extent to which actually you think that the opusectile work and the uh, tessellated work are actually contemporary with each other, not so much the largest around, and the obviously 12th or 13th I, century stuff, I but the central stuff. Periods, but I, I'm, I'm not someone to, to pronounce on that floor. To me, looking at it, it has two periods at least. And if any of it is like Pomposa reused Roman work or late antique work, relayed by people who knew how to do it, but even that I'm not sure about. The quality is not great in any of it. Some of it's all right and a lot of it's poor. But that's not a, a, an indication of date. But when you look at something like Pomposa, it's a bit of a mess, but it's stunning, stunning work. But then as the writers of these art, three articles I looked at recently about the Adriatic school of mosaics, all say, of course, we have no dates for any of them. It's rather sort of undermines the whole thing. But uh, I, I was, the other thing, actually, I was slightly troubled by oh. the apparent absence of very much Roman material or reused Roman material in what is a source of water somewhere between yes. Italy and now that's Dalmatia. You'd expect, actually, to be a Roman port. Now, but the, uh, the interesting thing, this takes me to another thought, but the 2019 um, report on the Bologna excavations, uh, which has only just come out, uh, the, they're actually not talking about that island at all. They're talking about San Domino. That's where all the Roman stuff is. And the Roman stuff, is a lot of it is dug into cliffs and dug into the ground, and which may not have ever had much standing structure. But the thing that occurred to me when I re read that, I thought, ah, they're all talking about another island altogether. I think Monte Cassino was pulling a fast one. And I think that they, if they were there in an unknown date, and St. Nicola the Hermit was there, that they were on the bigger island. And St. Nicola became a hermit by going to the unoccupied island. You would hardly go and sit in the back garden as a hermit. You would cut yourself off. And that if that other island had a Roman well in it, but no means of vegetation of any kind until very recently, you can't grow anything on it. But that Monte Cassino overlooks the fact with the Pope that the abbey they're talking about now is not the presence they might have had in the island on the other island, which may have failed. Because there is a, a, a conflict early on as to whether the, the monastery is called St. James, its first references, or Our Lady, Santa Maria. Now, it could have become Santa Maria when the icon arrived, but it could be that, that Monte Cassino is pulling a fast one, and they had a settlement on the big island dedicated to St. James, which failed, and a new settlement, a new monastery altogether, free of Monte Cassino, was established under Conrad II. There's no one will say that, but it, the implication that we've got two names, potentially two monasteries, two islands, and that where would the hermit go and be a hermit? Not at the back door. You, you know, going to another island would make sense. A lot of this stuff, though, is actually being stirred up when Desiderius is abbot, isn't it? And this yes. is a time when Monte I mean, Cassino... Is, any of it. Because it's in the wrong part of Italy, yes. as far as Monte Cassino is concerned. And they're really stirring things up because a lot of those possessions are suddenly coming under Norman control. And the Malisi area, in particular, is heavily in dispute. Yeah, and that's where they, that the Bologna that's say, why you're getting all that's what Bologna say, the majority of their, of Clemente's investments were from the emperor. Yeah, I mean, well, I, I mean, but Monte Cassino gets so stressed that it embarks on a whole series of forgeries, uh, monastic forgeries, and I'd, I'd be interested to dig into that, actually, the, the extent to which Monte Cassino is trying to uh, involve itself in cases where it may not actually have uh, a monastic claim in the first instance. I mean, the whole business of those, as I say, those legends with no dates, they all come from Monte Cassino. So that they, you know, they had to be treated with a pinch of salt. In fact, one of, the, one of the icons that passes to Italy is paid for with a third of a salt pan. The bishop parts with a third of a salt pan, which was presumably there for a very valuable thing to have in the, in the, in the Adriatic. But there's clearly, it's, it's a big business in that little church. And that's why what seems to draw Monte Cassino's attention to it. Well, uh, Emma has a few pages, I thought, <coughs> as well, and, and Richard at the back. Um, it wasn't really a question, it was just that um, I think it's. Oh, is that better? Yeah. It wasn't really a question, it was just to add to your um, musings about. Um, 
uh, uh, the possessions of the Abbey. Um, is that, is it Luke, Luke Brand of Cremona is um, accused of smuggling, s smuggling purple silks from um, Constantinople in the late 10th century on one or two of his, um, his diplomatic trips there for the Ottonian court. I only got a bit of that. <laughs> uh, are we talking about the fabric? Yes. Does anyone know anything about this fabric? A search of Google and where everything today did not turn up anything other than the one reference which led me to it in the first place. It's called Scaramani. Because it contains silk, and only the court could produce silk in the West, that therefore it had to come from inside court circles, which made me think, ah, the diplomats had access to those sorts of things, and put them in with the scotch and everything else to go through diplomatic bags without customs looking at them. Well, the yes, but the woman who let me just pull you back to that um, paper, that the, the this publication. Now, the the essay in this, uh, she defines what that cloth is. Uh, it's, it contains silk, therefore it's either come from China or it's come from from Constantinople, and she says it was specifically reserved for imperial court dress and vestment. So, I only having found that six weeks ago, and I, she must be in Cambridge somewhere. I must ring her up and ask her because she's probably the only person in the world who knows exactly what it is. But clearly it, was, it cost far more for, for that cloth than golden icons and all the rest of it from Constantinople. So it's obviously a highly prized thing. And Trameti seems to be the only people in the, in the West that can get it today. It's a bit, it's a, it's a Fortnum and Mason stuff though, isn't it? Um, may I uh, echo Julian's point in saying uh, how brilliantly you brought the subject to light. Have a, Few comments and certainly in late medieval England, late medieval England, which is the period I know, hermits do not necessarily go to remote places at all. Know, they break themselves it, up, don't they? Or whatever. Yeah. It may be different, obviously, in 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 that period in Italy. I think that if we have no dates for it, but clearly he existed before the abbey was built on his tomb. So that's our only date. And that abbey is clearly of the 1030. I suspect that hermits who leave a community before a thousand are still thinking of Desert Fathers, sort of, you know, isolated, you know, starved to death, and they have to go away, and become basically very grumpy. And it would be difficult to do that if your, your community was constantly going out and saying, are you all right, dear? Would you like a cup of tea? You think you, I think it's a period where you did cut yourself off. And in the cosy Middle Ages in Northern Europe, no, you might go into a little you know, a, a chancery building or an alcove or something. But I think the tradition is, is different. But I, I may have not have followed what you were saying, but I was left with the question, why would Trimiti rather than Vieste be the hub for um, the transactions between the German and Byzantine emperors? Probably because it was safe from being robbed. I don't know how often you've been to that part of Italy, but even if you go to the tourist office in Bari today, they say you won't go out at night, will you? Uh, that element of, of bringing very, very expensive things, trading with them, having somewhere safe which you negotiate. Once you've been paid and it leaves your hands, if you get, you know, pirates get them on the way out, fine, but you've got your money. I think the idea of it being a safe haven is what attracts the German emperors, what attracts the trading hub, because it is in the, you know, who owns it? Apparently the German emperor, so they're not gonna really mess with it. So, I, mean, it is, it, I haven't got my head around this. After many years of thinking about this, in the last few weeks, this has all suddenly arrived, and it has given me an abyss in the forehead, because I don't know what to make of it all. And the Italian articles, particularly this one uh, in the, the school of, um, in um, Rome, is so uh, dense in its text. I have been, it's pages and pages and pages. I have the gist of it, and it did lead me on to where I needed to be, and that was to look at this abbey of Beshevo. Where is Richard? 
Oh, he's hiding from me. Let me know. He should change his name. Um, thank you very much. That was fantastic. Brought back very happy memories. Um, I, as for a, for a monastic church, it's a very curious shape. It is. Um, and I always presumed that the the the, the, the nave, i.e., the the square area west of the the um, triple arch, was the nave was mon was monastic, and that. There wasn't a need. There wasn't a a need for um, passing people to, to be in it, unless uh, they were and that the unless West, they were high status people. Uh, high status and the gallery, um, and that yes, your 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 passing fishermen um, would have if they came to a mass or anything, they would witness it from just witness it from that gallery, and the public general public weren't at all allowed into well, the I wider would, area. It's not, I, it's not sort of parochial. I, this back, I just put know. this back up because something I didn't see. Yeah. But it, in relation to this floor of which I know nothing, right? yeah. the central square area coming down could well have been the first part of the floor with the monastic stalls arranged around it. Yeah. And so that the rather indifferent floral work was underneath the stalls. And, well, that, you, and that you did have a, a credit for how many monks there? Well, if not, many, you no. have not that many, and they, I don't know that you would need monastic stalls as such in the nave. You would simply have uh, benches, altars, uh, or altars, or, 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 or lights and things uh, around the around the edges. And it was the processions went round the aisles, well, and the monks sat up in in the uh, that tiny chancel. In tiny chancel. Well, they could have under the elephant, over the elephant. It's very tiny. Yeah. You've seen it. It's very yes. tiny. Yes. But the, the, the reason I kept questioning about the west door is because if there was a west door, and I think there must have been a west door, yeah. then local no, fishermen could have come in the west door, gone along the south aisle, because if it's to see the shrine from the south aisle, they're not dealing with sound of the people. No. It's just what sound they are dealing with. Quite. Because the north side is the only access to the monastery, just to see and to stare out of the lobby. Yeah. Yeah. So this is not a public. At all. No. And I think that's why the VIPs and the visiting uh, uh, Antonian bishops are sitting. Uh, and that the public, when they do arrive, come in the south side and only see the south side and go back out again. If they were not dealing with huge numbers. It would, if, as long as there was a west door. You, there, there must have been a way in other than the north door, which is the only right. way at the moment, because it's in the cloister. The, the west door is the obvious thing. Is the obvious thing. Yeah. It's all and, and perhaps they didn't even go up the south aisle. They just stood in, stood in that area there, um, on the ground. The and what here, sorry? The, 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 so the, the, the visitors, the lay visitors, didn't go any further than that, that arch, Possibly, that I, western what, arch. If I can just flash back through a couple of images, but one thing that's interesting is about thinking about where was this Madonna, this Mary, the Holy Mother of God? Now, she could have been an altar piece, of course, and that would have solved the problem. She was on the altar. But they have, I can, I can get back to that far in the, in the lecture, but they have got... Um, now, an interesting placing of something in the church, as you probably remember, and that is they put an altar, that, uh, a crucifix that blocks the western building in order to stop you from going into the north aisle. And that is a very interesting possibility that that's where, in fact, you had the Madonna, because uh, she would, people could have accessed her immediately from the west door and then gone. If they didn't want to see the grumpy saint, uh, they could then have gone. I, I'm not finding the, the, the slide that I need, sorry. But there's one that shows a crucifix blocking that um, western end, uh, that western. Oh, there. And if you if you thought of having your, if you had a west door and your icon that people we know are coming to see where that crucifix now is, that would then conceal the stair up, the stair up to the lobby, and the monastic door on the north side, which would mean that if they did want to go and see the grumpy saint, there's no evidence that they were interested in him. Uh, they could go along the south side. It seems you've got two different communities going to this church. The, the odd fishermen and these people from, from Zadar in Croatia, the old Croatian people, who are, we're told, in great numbers, but that's just what monasteries will say, isn't it? Yeah. And it's a huge, a really big tomb cut into the rock. Yeah. And there's still some sort of evidence for it. Uh, nobody's looked for those. Right? No. And 
just as I say, I can't prove looking at it that anyone's lifted any of that floor at all. But up behind the church, behind the great fortified East End, there's a whole series of rock cut tombs which are now empty. They're just literally dug down into yes. solid rock. And presumably that, that's what he had. Yes, what, uh, what else? Yeah, I mean, that makes sense. Yeah. Do we have do we have any more questions? Just one more question. Now's your chance. Thirty-five years since Frank spoke here, so you might be another <laughs> more than that. Thirty-five well, nineteen eighty-seven years. <laughs> That might be, come on, so now's your chance. It'll be another 35 years. No, no, I think it will be. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, if that's the case, then let's thank uh, Frank again for his very wonderful talk. Thank <laughs> you.